It's a lovely day in August 2012. It's a great day to be here with my Hawaiian shirt and several friends. Okay, we're just a bit further down the street on the Rue Jean Calvin. Calvin's first three years in Geneva were not easy, 1536 through 1539. He had never even pastored a church. He was only 27 years old. And normally we wouldn't entrust a major YWAM base to someone of that age, but the Lord entrusted him with the whole Reformation, the whole French Reformation. But he had very low people skills. He was very black and white and very hard on people because he was hard on himself. He was very um, disciplined, very committed, very principled. So he was in constant conflict with the city fathers. As I mentioned, he, he said, the church is not in charge of the city. The church will teach you and hold you accountable. But you are in charge of the city. It's a separate sphere. <coughs> but the city fathers were being coached by the city fathers of Bern who was kind of the protector power of Geneva against, as we mentioned, the Duke of Savoy. So they were influenced by the Lutheran Reformation. And Zwingli, who was the Swiss apostle, was even stronger than Luther in his declaration that the church was under the authority of the state. So in Lutheran theology, the other thing is, if you're a citizen of the city, and it's a Lutheran city, you're a Christian. And if you've been baptized, once in your life, you take communion. So the city fathers of Bern told the city fathers of Geneva, just have Calvin and Farrell serve everybody commu communion on Easter Sunday, because that way, that'll bring unity to the city. That's what we do, and it works great. So the city fathers told Calvin and Farrell to do this, and they said, no, we're not doing this because it's not up to you. This is under the sphere of the church. We decide who's a Christian, you don't decide. We decide who gets communion, you don't decide. This is under our authority, not yours. So they said, yes, you'll give communion. They said, no, we won't. Yes, we will. Yes, you will. No, we won't. Yes, you will. No, we won't. This went on for a while until Easter Sunday, 1539. Calvin preached in the cathedral, which is just behind here. And Farrell preached in the second parish, which is just two streets over. They both preached on sin and judgment and then excommunicated the entire population of Geneva. <laughs> which means, theologically, that they told them they were excluded from the grace of God and they were all going to hell because they were such terrible sinners. Then they left town. This is another one of their audiovisual audio teaching strategies. Farrell went back to Neuchâtel and Calvin went to Strasbourg, where he worked with the great reformer there, Martin Busset. And Calvin was pastor of the French-speaking refugees because it was a German-speaking town at the time. He had a wonderful time there. He, he wrote later that it was the best time of his life. He didn't have the weight of the city on him. He just had a, a congregation of French-speaking refugees. And he met a lady, the widow of an Anabaptist leader named Idelette de Bure. And he met her and fell in love and asked her to marry him and adopted her two children. <clears throat> One of the reasons that Calvin had such a high view of women for someone of his, of his era was that um, he had a, a huge respect and love for this woman. And that carried over into his relations with other women. He carried on correspondence, for example, with Protestant ladies from France and Italy as they wrote and asked him questions. They did push him on one area. <clears throat> they said, if you really believe, as you teach, in the priesthood of all believers, then women should be able to be pastors. Which, of course, is completely true. <laughs> But Calvin, being a man of his era, could not make that step. He, he took the respect for women much further than it had ever gone, especially in his, his insistence on the teaching of girls how to read. But he could not take that final step. And of course, we still have people today who can't take that step. So we shouldn't be too critical of Calvin. Anyway, <clears throat> he was happy in Strasbourg, but the, the city fathers of Geneva realized they needed him. So they sent a delegation up there and they said, listen, the Duke of Savoy is threatening again and we are not united enough to stop him. You have got to come back and help us. You're the only one who can bring us together. 
Otherwise, um, he will take us over and we'll be forced to deny our faith and everything you started to, be, to build will be lost. Besides, we found a house for you. It's not far from the cathedral. It's got a garden, a view of the, of the lake. And uh, we're ready to move you and your family down there. <clears throat> Calvin remembered the word of the Lord to him through Pharaoh and agreed with a heavy heart to come back to Geneva. He knew he was laying his life down, and he did. Many of the engravings of his last years, you see him meeting with leaders around his sick bed um, because he, he did have some kind of lung problem. We haven't figured out exactly, but he died from that. And as you saw from the dates on the sign, he, uh, he died very young at the age of 55. So his house was here on this place until 1706 when it was torn down and replaced by this existing building. Okay, now we're going down the street and around the corner to the left. Okay, here we are in the Grand Rue. Most Swiss towns have a street named the Grand Rue. It's the uh, principal shopping street. And in the 16th century, that's exactly what this was. Now it's uh, mostly art galleries and stores that sell idols of different kinds. Um, there were two waves of French Protestant refugees called Huguenots. One came out of France in the time Calvin did, in the 1530s and later, because you had a choice. You could leave and take what you could carry, leaving your property and everything behind. Or you could stay, but you had to deny your Protestant faith and declare that you wanted to become a Catholic. So thousands upon thousands of French Protestants chose to leave, including one of my ancestors. <coughs> so in the second wave, after that first wave, there was a, a Protestant who became king of France. He had to not deny his faith in order to do that. He, he is said to have declared, when he was criticized for this by his Protestant friends, he is said to have said, uh, well, Paris is worth a, worth a mass. So the seducing power of that city he gave, gave up his faith for. But he did grant religious freedom to the Protestants. So for three generations, they had religious freedom in, in France, most of the 17th century. In 1685, um, after the Protestant king was assassinated, stabbed to death, in 1685 the new king revoked the freedom of the Protestants, and then there was a second wave of Protestant refugees that came out of France and went around the world. Many of them went to South Africa, they went to Holland, they went to England, they went to Germany. There are still many villages with French names just across the Rhine. And they went to America. A non-Christian French historian has said, <clears throat> France has never recovered from the loss of those people. These were our best citizens. They were the hardest working, the honest ones. They were the ones who, had the, who were the artisans. And we have never recovered from their loss. Very honest assessment. In that second wave of refugees, there was a clockmaker named Rousseau. He came and set up shop here in the Grand Rue and had his apartment above his shop up here. And his son Jean-Jacques was born just 300 years ago in 1712 in this house. The father got in trouble with the authorities, kind of runs in the family apparently, <laughs> and he was banished from the city. Jean-Jacques was placed with a Protestant pastor in a little village out in the country and this is where he got his love of, of nature. Now, Jean-Jacques Rousseau was a genius who is still teaching the world today. But he was a genius for bad ideas. He had every bad idea you can imagine. I'm still discovering his bad ideas. And by the way, his former uh, house is a, is a museum upstairs. And it's one of these free museums of the city of, of Geneva. A very good display on his life. Um, I call him the godfather of post-modernity. There's nothing that we find in post-modernity in, in the present generation that we do not all already see in Rousseau. These ideas are, are very old. We go back to the Greeks, as all ideas do. They come around again, and now we call it post-modernity. With Rousseau, we called it romanticism. He was the father of the romantic movement. So there were two, two currents in the 18th century exemplified here in Geneva by two men, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was born here, and Voltaire, who came here when he was banished from Paris. Um, 
we'll talk more about Voltaire a bit later, but Rousseau was all about spontaneity, experience, intuition, and feeling. He was totally against uh, any kind of structures. He said the way to educate children is just to let them run free and play out in the woods and the pastures. We don't need schools, we don't need governments, That's, they're the cause of all our problems. We're not going to we're not going to use reason or logic because they're not going to help us find anything. We just need to, f to feel what's, what we think is right and do it. Rousseau was the, the father of the victim mentality that is so strong today. But in other words, my problems are not my responsibility, but you're, you're causing my problems and you need to fix it. Rousseau said there's no law, there's no sin. He actually wrote a book called uh, Rousseau Judged by Jean-Jacques. When he, in which he wrote, you can't judge me because I know that I have done nothing wrong. It's true that I've stolen things, but I'm not a thief. It's true that I've not raised any of my five children, but I'm still a good father. <laughs> so this is just a, a perfect summary of the postmodern mentality. Um, <clears throat> so his, his work on education, though, even though it's completely worthless as a strategy for educating children, it's still taught in every university in the world that teaches teachers. If you study to be a school teacher in Japan, Korea, anywhere in the world, you have to read Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Now, they don't mention Calvin, who was the father of university education, but they, you have to read Rousseau, who came up with these completely unworkable ideas about educating children that even he didn't practice. In all my reading about Rousseau, no one ever said he was born one street away from Calvin's house. Because we've just come around the block here. Calvin's house is one street away. I think uh, he picked up the mantle for teaching the nations that was forged in the spirit by Calvin and his apostolic team. We'll talk more later about the, how the teaching went out. We already mentioned how hollow it was uh, affected. But there was, I don't know how this happens, but I believe it's, it does happen. I checked it with Lauren and there was, in the spirit, there's a mantle forged when something powerful happens like that. But then it's up to the church to decide, like the young prophet Elisha had to decide, do we want to pick up the mantle? Do we want the mantle when the old prophet drops it? And that, if you read the story of Elijah and Elisha, he, Elisha had to pursue this guy. He did not travel in a straight line. He went round and round. And Elisha had to be there when that mantle fell. And he was. When Calvin's mantle fell, three generations after the Reformation, the church did not pick it up. That mantle fell to the ground, fell to the dust. Because we did not believe any longer that teaching the nations was part of our job description. We thought that was up to, the, up to someone else, up to the government. Yeah. Well, Rousseau picked it up. Lenin picked it up in the 20th century. And I believe that if the church does not pick up a mantle like that, the devil is very happy to send his agents to pick it up and to teach the nation. So here's the question to us. Are we going to pick it up this, this time? Okay, let's go over here to the city hall.